Sean Cleary, are you here? Is Sean online? I am indeed. I can't see you. There you are. Okay. Hello, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, let me introduce our next speaker to you, Sean Cleary. Um, is the Chairman of Strategic Concepts Limited. He's the Managing Director of the Center for Advanced Governance and Founder and Executive Chair of the Future World Foundation. Importantly, he is also a member of the IASC International, International Board. And, you know, Sean, previously we've had, um, we've had uh, presentations with, from military expertise, from diplomatic expertise, and when I try to categorize you, I just thought you were an omnivore. You know, you can pretty much <laughs> cover all fields. So I'm, I'm curious, and I will be surprised with what you come up with today. So welcome. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jody. And I promise not to eat anyone. So <laughs> at least that part of being an omnivore won't be part of what I do. I'm also going to dispense with slides. There are is a set, if honor has it, and students are more than welcome to have a look at those in greater depth. But I think in the interest of time, it makes sense to try in one sense to characterize the way in which one sees the situation, but also in part um, to respond to the absolutely splendid uh, presentations that frankly, all of you, including you, Jody, have made up to this point in time. I remember Kay Ordick from your earlier writings, and I think it is highly applicable um, at this point in time. Um, but I also want to celebrate, in a certain sense, both the linear directness that Sir Richard offered in offering a military perspective on the present situation. Because if one doesn't understand the challenges of the battlefield, if one doesn't understand the strategic context within which the struggle is being fought, then by definition, we will make horrendous mistakes in the way in which we manage it. That said, as the focus of this discussion, as I understand it, is on in part structuring for a subsequent peace after the event, and as the frame that we're using for discussion is that of complexity, I would argue that the problem that we have is that that specific strategic focus on what is necessary to win the war undercuts the frame that we have to address when we ask what will the future peace look like. And Emil, I think, uh, introduced a very important idea into the midst of that, the idea of a European security architecture that excluded Russia. I, I must honestly say it's the first time I've heard that expressed in as simple terms. Carl Bildt, right at the beginning, said something rather like Sir Richard this afternoon, which is that peace without Putin, or peace with Putin, I'm sorry, is perhaps impossible. But arguing that Russia cannot be part of a future security architecture is a remarkable further step. Let me offer a few thoughts to shape my own perspective. I think the terrifying thing about what we've seen over the last now nearly 12 months since the 24th of February is that firstly, Putin violated Article 2 of the UN Charter, as everyone knows. He violated at least four principles of peremptory international law, those that we think of as being US cogens. He violated rules of humanitarian and human rights law at scale, and the ICC, I am sure, will find that Russian troops have committed crimes against humanity of various sorts within the framework of their activity. It's very difficult to argue that the scale of shelling against civilian infrastructure that has been undertaken is not, not only prima facie, but self-evidently uh, such a crime against humanity. That said, however, the truth is 
And I think that's where Sir Richard was starting. One, the West failed to deter this. And a failure of deterrence is a frightening concept in nuclear age. Secondly, the West did not execute its responsibility to protect in terms of well-established United Nations principles since 2004. And if one looks at all of the language, both private and public around that decision, it was for fear that Mr. Putin might use his nuclear arsenal. That creates a situation where in effect, we have no instruments of deterrence. And in the context of Mr. Putin's bluster, which Mr. Medvedev has perhaps exceeded, it is difficult to know where the line is between where we are at present and where we would go to before an act of desperation emerged in Moscow. I have no technical view on it, so I'm going to leave it there. But there's a larger question, I think, about all of this. We are still speaking as though we can control the outcome. And one of the most fundamental insights out of an understanding of the complexity of the systems that we are a part of is that the illusion of control is precisely what usually leads us into catastrophe. It was the illusion that we could deter Mr. Putin with everything that we have known since at least his speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, his action vis-a-vis -vis Georgia in 2008, his actions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine in 2014, and innumerable actions on a smaller scale since then, including in Syria in the aftermath of the notional red line in respect of chemical weapons not, in fact, being maintained by the West. Despite all of that, we seemed to continue to believe that deterrence was possible, and we did not act so as to exercise our responsibility to protect. More difficult, I think, if one focuses on the idea of excluding Russia for a greater or a shorter period of time from a European security architecture is what we have done vis-a-vis -vis China in the same period. Because the binary distinction between techno-democracies and techno-autocracies, despite the fact that Mr. Xi, quite frankly, was horrified when Putin went in on the 24th of February, precisely because non-violation of the territorial integrity of sovereign states is a central pillar of both the national security and foreign policy of the People's Republic of China. And despite the fact that numerable, innumerable statements, there are at least nine, and I think we're going to hear another one on the 24th of February from Wang Yi, probably, but it may be from Xi, Despite the fact that there are at least nine statements to date where the Chinese have made very clear that the sovereign integrity of national borders is a principle that they hold dear, we have chosen to underutilize China in respect of grappling with Putin. I think we're at the point now where that is about to happen, but quite frankly, surveillance balloons and similar things being downed off the coast of South Carolina after having traversed the continental United States seemed in terms of the exchange in Munich between Blinken and Wang Yi to have exacerbated the problem rather than having resolved it. One can only hope that whether it is Wang Yi's speech or Xi's speech on the 24th will bring back the same sort of sobriety that we saw after the meeting between Biden and Xi in Bali. But then we have to ask ourselves outside of all this, we have to ask ourselves, what is the world we wish to create? Yes, we need fundamentally to restructure the global architecture, no, quite frankly, we do not have the financial resources to be able to divert the sort of scale of investment 
into military preparedness that would be the natural consequence of fighting an extended war for a decade or longer. The contraction in the global economy, the effects in respect of energy costs and food costs, and the implications in respect of inflation are not tolerable even in the medium term. We are sitting with at least 450 billion costs associated with the reconstruction of Ukraine at present. Assuming that the war continues for another 12 months, by definition, those numbers will increase highly significantly and the resources of the world to be able to address them are going to decline. And the impacts for less developed countries, in particularly, and particularly those that have no fiscal space whatever, is going to be quite devastating during that period. The West will not hold the rest on side if it pursues such a strategy. So the complexity of the moment that we face requires us to do two things. One is avoid sleepwalking into war. And by that, I mean with China. I don't think Mr. Chi wishes to invade Taiwan. He wishes to incorporate Taiwan unquestionably. It's part of the constitution of the People's Republic of China. And one of the things that the Chinese have spent most time on since Bali has been getting every US spokesman that has engaged with them to repeat Washington's commitment to the one China policy and strategic ambiguity. But I do think that as happens in every human relationship, when things go sour, when one is perceived to be insulting the other by the other, the other loses tolerance. And an escalation into conflict quite often occurs without any intention for that to occur. Sir so Richard mentioned the battlefields of the First World War. It's worth remembering that no single power after a Serbian nationalist assassinated an Austrian Grand Duke wished to have a world war in 1914. But in four months, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the French, the Germans, and even the British eventually were at war. And that war lasted four years and cost tens of millions of lives. Miscalculation is a frightening thing. And we have to think very carefully about what the plans are for the day after and how we will go about constructing an order that enables us to be able to survive together within the framework of essential norms, essential rules of international law, essential principles of conduct, which have been so egregiously violated in the present circumstance. I leave it there until the discussion.